Welcome to the Frog of History, the podcast for people who like history but struggle to remember that the Civil War was more than just an oxymoron. I'm your host, Don Griffith. In this episode, what happened to the first African American recipient of the Medal of Honor? Now, many of us might have heard about one of the great African American heroes of the Civil War, William Harvey Carney. And he was a sergeant in the 54th Massachusetts Volunteer Infantry. And on July 18, 1863, during the assault on Fort Wagner, just outside Charleston, South Carolina, the man carrying the Union flag known as the Color Bearer was killed. Now, the Color Bearer was a crucial job. In the midst of confusion on the battlefield, soldiers could look for the colors, the flag, to get their bearings and know which way to go. It was a dangerous job, easy to spot by both friend and foe. The enemy sharpshooters could pick out the color bearer and put them in their sights. And when the 54th color bearer was killed, Carney got to the flag before it even hit the ground, and he carried it the rest of the battle, notwithstanding several serious wounds he had sustained. After returning to his own lines, he handed the flag to another soldier and said, I only did my duty. The old flag never touched the ground. A true American hero. While Sergeant Carney's bravery was without question, it would only take 37 years in 1900 before his actions were recognized worthy of the Medal of Honor. His was only one of many African Americans whose great deeds have gone unrecognized or were late in being recognized by a nation that still struggles with its past. Here on The Frog, though, we have no such struggle. We're not afraid to hop into the pot full of boiling water. We recognize that American history really is like a lily pond. It's lovely on the surface and from afar, like a Monet painting. But upon closer examination, we see the pond scum, the murkiness of its waters. But we can also see, when examined in context, that it's an ecosystem that thrives because of its diversity and interdependencies. And my 10th grade biology teacher would be proud of that analogy. Now, Carney's heroic actions, however, were the earliest to have occurred in the war among the 25 African-American soldiers who received the Medal of Honor. And for this reason, he's often mistakenly cited as the first African-American recipient of the Medal of Honor. And while any Medal of Honor recipient is deserving of remembrance from the citizens of a grateful nation, in this case, the first African-American to actually receive a Medal of Honor was awarded his medal only four months after his actions. Now, his heroic acts occurred on Christmas Day, 1863, just a little over five months after Kearney's late May battle. This battle, too, occurred just outside Charleston. But instead of having to wait 37 years, he was immediately recognized for his actions and received his citation only four months later along with three fellow white sailors from the same battle. Now, in case you missed that, let me say it again. Yes, they were sailors, not soldiers. With the possible exception of the battles between the Ironclads Monitor and Merrimack, or as it's also known by its Confederate States title, the CSS Vermont, it was built on the hull of the captured USS Merrimack, and the little Confederate submarine Hunley, few people grasped the magnitude and importance of the naval operations during the Civil War. The ground war gets all the glory, thanks in part to the unintended consequences of Civil War documentarians just not focusing on this critical element. And let's face it, nobody understands Navy jargon except Navy people anyway, and those guys at the Yacht Club who wear ascots and funny hats. Now, this sailor's name was Robert Blake. Only a year and a half before, he had escaped enslavement. It's not entirely clear how he escaped. There are two conflicting narratives, both involving, though, the same plantation and slave owner. Now, this occurred about the time of a skirmish between the Union Navy and Marines on one side and the Confederate Army forces on the other along the Santee River, about 40 miles north of Charleston. And unfortunately, very little is known about Robert's life before he escaped or after his service in the Civil War. Scant evidence in the form of a couple of pension applications of someone bearing the same name are all that now remain of his life postbellum. No one can say for sure that that pension application is about the same person, more on this a little later. And no one knows what happened to Robert or the medal he received. And no one knows where he's buried. It's a tragedy for any service member to be forgotten. It is particularly so when it comes to a Medal of Honor recipient. Lost in the fog of history. That's what we'll cover in this episode of The Frog of History. Like always, we'll need some context. But first, a word from our sponsors. Still no sponsors. So on with the context. By the summer of 1862, the Civil War was not going well for the Union. It was a stalemate at best. 
Jefferson Davis had appointed Robert E. Lee as the new commander of the Southern troops, and the Northern and Southern armies were at loggerheads in and around Northern Virginia. Both in America and abroad, the war, at least politically and officially, was not yet viewed as a battle to end slavery, but rather a dispute over self-government. Lincoln was still waiting for a Union victory after which he could release the Emancipation Proclamation. That wouldn't come until September at the Battle of Antietam, which was really a draw, but served Lincoln's purposes well enough. In the meantime, European powers had remained largely neutral. King Cotton, while turning out not to be the critical staple to the Europeans the Confederates hoped it would be, was still a valuable import to much of Europe and especially to Great Britain. The Europeans' interests were also served by remaining neutral. Not only would they try to trade with both sides, but let the upstart and growing United States destroy itself by civil war, and we Europeans can step in to save the day. Mediate a resolution, meaning two countries instead of one, clean up the mess and conveniently expand our empires and influence in the Americas without the expense of our own blood and treasure. Kind of like a boxing referee stepping in at the end of a draw and declaring himself the winner. Now remember, slavery had only been abolished in the territories of Great Britain in 1833, and it didn't take effect until 1834, less than 30 years before. Indeed, many of the aristocratic elites who governed in Britain could attribute their own family wealth to slavery in the Caribbean. And while they may have paid lip service to the abolition of slavery, their economic interests far outweighed any concerns most had about the welfare of an enslaved people an entire ocean away. Of course, the southern states relied heavily on Europe for imports of material vital to their war effort. In recognizing this, General Winfield Scott and Secretary of State William Henry Seward recommended a blockade of southern ports to prevent trade between the rebellious states and the merchant interests of the European powers in their Caribbean colonies. Now, blockade is a tricky thing, though, both logistically and legally. On the logistics side, the Confederates had ports across the south from Virginia to Florida. Then you take a hairpin turn at the Keys and you've got the entire Gulf Coast. Then, of course, there's that little town called New Orleans and that little creek called the Mississippi River. That's a lot of ground, or water, to cover. In fact, there's a political cartoon of Scott's idea to crush the Confederacy slowly around its border like a giant snake. The cartoon lampoons the idea because many in the North thought the war could be easily won just by marching on Richmond, Virginia. The cartoon is captioned, Scott's Great Snake, and it's sometimes referred to as the Anaconda Plan. Now this plan, though, would take a lot of ships, a lot of supplies, and most importantly for our story, a lot of sailors. And on the legal side, it may sound like a distinction without a difference, but calling something a blockade is a lot bigger deal than calling it closing the ports. In an insurrection, a country closes its ports to keep the rebels from receiving supplies or shipping off goods to make money. But you can't stop neutral ships in international waters if you think they're trying to sneak into the port with supplies. With a blockade, however, you can stop and board neutral ships in international waters if you think they're carrying contraband, dispatches, or otherwise attempting to break the blockade. The problem with a blockade, though, is that this other side would then be considered a belligerent, almost like another country. Because you don't blockade your own ports, you just close them. You only blockade somebody else's ports. So calling it a blockade meant the Europeans could be neutral and consider the Confederates as belligerents with the ability to hear their concerns and offer diplomatic discussions. And you can see why the president needed to be a lawyer. The legal issues in this war would torment Lincoln during his entire administration. And one of those legal issues plays a significant role in our story about Robert Blake. And more on this a little later. So President Lincoln chose to call it a blockade, knowing, though, that by doing so, he was risking the Europeans recognizing the Confederate states as belligerents. He was betting on the Europeans' need to continue trade with the Union and avoiding war with them to at least keep them from meddling too much in the conflict. And he was mostly right. Of course, there is no international law against running a blockade, and many British merchants, likely with the nod of their aristocratic government, ran the blockade like angry Boston drivers on the mass turnpike after a Red Sox loss at Fenway Stadium. That's when 55 miles per hour is merely a suggestion. Something like four out of every five runs was a success, though most ships would eventually get caught. Their crews would be released if they were from a neutral country, so they'd just hop on another ship. Over a thousand blockade-running ships were captured or destroyed during the war. So the Union began its blockade not too long after the attack on Fort Sumter. President Lincoln officially announced the proclamation of blockade against southern ports in April 1861. But because there was such a huge stretch of coastlines and ports to patrol, remember that anaconda plan, 
The Union Navy split up the blockade into sections. South Carolina was one of the states covered by the South Atlantic Blockading Squadron. Now, given the difficulties of resupplying the ships using the blockade, in November of 1861, the Union took in one of the earliest amphibious operations of the war, Port Royal. That lies between Charleston and Savannah, Georgia. You know it today as Marine Corps Recruit Depot, Paris Island. Hilton Head is just across Port Royal Sound. Substantial support facilities were established at Port Royal in the aftermath, and ships serving in the Southern Atlantic Blockading Squadron used it as their base of operations, refueling and repairing there before heading out to chase, capture, or destroy the British-built and British-ran blockade-running ships delivering supplies to the Confederates. But what effect did all this Union presence in the heart of Dixie early in the war have on the slaves and our soon-to-be hero, Robert Blake? Now, the South Carolina coast, known as the Low Country, had numerous plantations. The Low Country, with its marshes and bogs, was fertile ground for rice. Large plantations developed there over more than 250 years of cultivation. Now, these plantations were established on the backs of thousands of enslaved people, most from West Africa. And they were originally brought to South Carolina in the 1600s and the 1700s, specifically because of their knowledge and ability to grow wet rice, just as they had in West Africa, where the climate and the landscape were similar. I mean, they were the experts. Now, as the Union established footholds across the South Carolina coast, these plantation owners, who were often absentee owners living in Charleston or even farther afield, didn't bother to return to their states. Those who did live on or near the plantations took what they could and fled to the Confederate-held interior. They left the slaves behind, presumably assuming that their obedient slaves would just continue to work the farms until the war ended in a Confederate victory. And then their benevolent owners could return with glad tidings of the new Confederacy. Well, that didn't quite go as planned. Instead, thousands did what any person might naturally do when the door has been left open for them to leave. They left! They headed for the nearest Union fort, sought asylum, and gave their prior enslavers the figurative middle finger. Now, most of the Union soldiers were more than happy to oblige. Thousands showed up. They were refugees. But like slaves throughout the South who had escaped bondage, the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 required that the slave be returned to his or her owner. So once liberated by the advancing Union army, the question was whether the Union, after the slaves were already under Union protection, had an obligation to turn over the slaves to their former owners. In fact, early in the war, this is exactly what was happening, and soldiers weren't happy about it. There are even letters from Union soldiers writing home complaining about the fact that they were required to send slaves back to their masters. Now, this led to the now famous decision by Major General Benjamin Franklin Butler to refuse to return three escaped slaves after he took command of Fort Monroe in Virginia in late May 1861. Now, Butler was a lawyer from Massachusetts, and he was a better politician than he was a general. He was no abolitionist, at least before the war. He was a Democrat. In fact, he was a delegate to the 1860 Democratic National Convention and had briefly supported Jefferson Davis there as a potential compromise candidate to avoid secession by the southern states. I mean, he was only appointed by President Lincoln to show that the war had bipartisan support, not because he had any military skills. Butler kind of looked like Dennis Franz. You know, the detective Andy Sipowitz on NYPD Blue? Look him up on Wikipedia and do a side-by-side -side comparison. It's doppelganger city. Apparently, Butler even acted like the brust detective, Sipowitz. He could be downright nasty and earn the reputation among the Confederates who had to deal with him as the Beast Butler. So three slaves escaped and arrived at Fort Monroe the day before Butler took command. And soon after, a Confederate officer presented himself to the general, claiming to represent the owner of the slaves, who also happened to be a Confederate colonel. And he demanded their return under the Fugitive Slave Act. Butler scratched his scruffy Andy Sipowitz mustache and thought and politely told the Confederate officer what the good colonel could do with his request. Now, Butler made two legal arguments for the refusal. He argued that since Virginia claimed to have seceded from the Union, they couldn't rely on a Union law to their advantage. And since Virginia, and for that matter the Constitution, considered slaves as property, then wartime laws regarding property applied. That is, if a rebellious person used their property as part of their rebellious activities, that property could be seized as contraband of war. And since the slaves were forced to work for the Confederate cause, including the supply of cotton, rice, and other staples to the military, farm property, from mills and houses to the slaves themselves, were contraband, subject to confiscation by the Union. 
Now, Lincoln wasn't happy about it because, again, it seemed to grant some legitimacy to the Confederate argument that they were a nation. But news of Butler's refusal spread rapidly. Northern newspapers picked up on the story, further fanning the flames of Butler's newfound fame. Someone coined the term contrabands as a euphemism for the escaped slaves, and it stuck. By August 1861, it was even in use throughout the military as a term for escaped slaves. A few weeks later, it became official wartime policy to refuse to remand the slaves to their owners. It also had the convenient effect of not calling them emancipated, so as not to insult the tender feelings of some in the North who weren't ready for emancipation. But this remarkable act of three slaves risking their lives to escape, followed by a lawyerly trick to confound a Confederate colonel, had the effect of growing into a movement, a movement that changed the course of the war. It had a devastating effect on Southern psychology, as now slaves had an even stronger incentive to make it to the Union lines, where they knew they would no longer be returned to their former bondage. And in the North, the notion of returning another human to bondage after liberating that same person became anathema. The war would now become a battle to free the slaves. As word got out, refugee camps, or contraband camps as they were called, sprung up around Union outposts. Some swelled into the thousands. Indeed, at Port Royal, one such camp grew so large that the government decided to see if it could be a model for a self-governing community of former slaves. It was called the Port Royal Experiment, and it worked well. Unfortunately, after the war, the politics of Reconstruction ended what could have been a completely different way to enable the newly freed slaves to govern their own communities. Now, the new contraband policy also meant that each time the Union military engaged in some action that took new ground or otherwise provided an opportunity for slaves to escape, the slaves attempted to do so. And one such slave is the hero of our story. Robert Blake was born, as best as can be determined, along the Santee River on one of three contiguous plantations of Arthur Blake. Now, Arthur came from a long line of plantation owners whose family had traded in human flesh for over a hundred years. The Santee River flows east-southeast from Lake Marion and into the Atlantic Ocean, about halfway between Charleston to the south and Myrtle Beach to the north. As it flows into the ocean, it splits in two about 15 miles upstream from the coast. The northern branch connects with Wadmakin Creek and becomes the North Santee River, and the southern branch continues to meander along as the South Santee. And in 1860, plantations growing rice lined its banks. Blake's plantations lied just inland on the South Santee River, some six or seven miles from the coast. Many hundreds, if not more, slaves worked on Blake's plantations. Indeed, the rice plantations had by far the largest concentration of slaves in America. The labor-intensive, back-breaking work required lots of human beings to clear the swamps, create the fields, till and hoe the rice, and thresh and winnow the husk. Blake alone held more than 500 people in bondage at any one time. Of course, he would have rarely bothered to visit the plantation. He knew full well the risks associated with living in a swamp. Malaria, yellow fever, other diseases carried by mosquitoes, poisonous snakes, and alligators, just to name a few. So while he lived his genteel life as absentee plantation owner, some 500 people were forced to stand in knee-deep muck from dawn to dusk, growing the rice that paid for his mint juleps. And sometime in the 1830s, possibly closer to 1840, Robert was born on one of them. Like many of his fellow enslaved people, he was a laborer, working the rice fields. His father may have had a first or last name named Singleton. Now more on that a little later. His struggle would have started from birth. The infant mortality among slave children was as high as one in three in South Carolina. And a child was in constant danger of mosquito-borne diseases, especially in the summer months. And their death rate was at least twice as high as a free person's. Just making it to adulthood was a gamble. And, even if one survived, there was little to look forward to as a slave on a rice plantation. The work was hard and dangerous. As a young man in his early 20s, he was at the peak of his usefulness to the plantation owners and would have been forced to work accordingly. It must have been an unimaginably miserable experience. It's no surprise, then, that when the opportunity arose to expurtate oneself from such a predicament, one capitalized on the opportunity. And for Robert, that opportunity came in June 1862. Now, there seems to be some confusion about how Robert came to enlist in the U.S. Navy. There are two different narratives. 
Some believe he was rescued as part of a battle between three Navy ships and Confederates who were firing on those ships from Blake's plantation on June 25th. Some 400 slaves were taken aboard the vessels after the battle and taken to North Island near Georgetown to a contraband camp there. And I'll get to that story in a minute. But deep in the official records of the Union and Confederate navies, there's an entry by acting volunteer Lieutenant Irvin B. Baxter, commander of the Bark USS Gem of the Sea. In his reports, Baxter states that around 6.30 in the morning on June 5th, they picked up five contrabands in a small boat belonging to a blockade-running ship called the Mary Stewart which had been captured just two days before on June 3rd. Apparently, the entire seven-man crew of the Mary Stewart had fled the ship on a boat just before it was captured. They landed the boat at Blake's plantation and then headed to Charleston, presumably where they could find transport back to safety and more blockade running. Now, the five slaves, seeing an abandoned boat, did the next logical thing. They took it. They made their escape from Arthur Blake's plantation, using the boat to head out into the Santee River. One of these refugees named Captain Blake was a boat pilot. So they were picked up by Lieutenant Baxter, and the men offered valuable intelligence about the comings and goings of various blockade runners using Blake's plantation and others nearby to support the Confederate cause, as well as the location and size of several Confederate outposts nearby. And Baxter notes in his notes that the slaves explained that their master was Arthur Blake, an Englishman, and that King Arthur had bravely ran away back to England a week after the attack on Fort Sumter. According to the escaped men, Blake had between 600 and 700 slaves. Some 300 or more were still on the plantation nearby. But, in Baxter's words, a great many had died from neglect and want of medicine, nearly one half. Now think about that. Arthur enslaved hundreds of people, demanding their labor and lives for his benefit. And then he abandoned them to fend for themselves and die. Now the names of the contrabands were Captain, Robert, Prince, John, and Michael. And they all took the last name Blake. Prince, John, and Michael were identified as boys, so they were likely in their early teens. They were taken back to Georgetown, just north of the Santee River, where the Union ships had dropped contrabands and a small contraband camp had been established. Within two weeks, though, Robert was listed on the muster roll of the Gem of the Sea as having enlisted on June 15th out of Georgetown. So is this our Robert? We don't know. There's another narrative that suggests Robert joined up a couple of weeks later. In other words, possibly there are two Robert Blakes. And with the Navy occupying Port Royal and Winya Bay at Georgetown, Navy commanders were looking for opportunities to make trouble for the Confederate Army as well as stopping the blockade runners. One such commander, George Prentice, who was in command of the USS Albatross, had the idea that he could steam three ships up the Santee to the Northeastern Railroad Bridge. That bridge was a vital communications link to Charleston, and he wanted to take the bridge. So he wrote to Admiral Samuel DuPont of the famous DuPont family and the flag officer for the Southern Atlantic Blockading Squadron, and he asked for three ships. And in late June, he was off on a mission along with some 60 Marines acting as sharpshooters aboard the ships and as an amphibious landing force. Now, the three ships headed upriver were the USS Western World, the Henry Hope, and the E.B. Hale. As they made their way into the South Santee River, they passed Blake's Plantation, where the Confederate Army had established that outpost. The ships passed it at first without incident, but they couldn't get much farther up the Santee because it was too difficult for the ships to navigate the winding river and there was a risk of running aground. So they turned around and headed back to Georgetown. And after passing Blake's plantation a second time, the rear ship was fired upon by the troops stationed on the plantation. The ships turned again to engage the troops, and battle ensued. The Marines, who were itching for a fight at the bridge and were probably disappointed they didn't get the chance to have one then, now had their fight. So the skirmish lasted about an hour. Now the Marines led by a Lieutenant Lowry, landed and tried to take a battery in the woods, but the rebels had fled. And during the skirmish, no one was killed, but two Marines were wounded. And upon returning to the plantation, they discovered a cache of arms and evidence indicating the rebels were using the plantation's buildings. So the house, mill, and 10,000 bushels of rice were burned. And guess what? You guessed it. The slaves were contraband. Some 400 persons were put aboard the three ships to escape their enslavement and moved to North Island just off of Georgetown. Some think Robert was one of the 400. We don't really know, and I'll get to why there can be some confusion in a bit. 
But here's the real outrageous kicker. Arthur Blake, our intrepid plantation owner who had abandoned the people ostensibly in his care, was such an upstanding citizen that he had the nerve to seek compensation for the loss of his slaves, first in the Confederacy in 1863 and then from the Union in applications running into the 1870s. Blake made copious notes of who he owned, listing out several hundred slaves by name with a value ascribed to each individual, from newborn babies to the elderly. If he had lost some socks, he would have probably listed those too. He valued his estate at $288,000, of which 240000 was 402 people valued at an average of $600 each. And in those lists, identified as coming from his Oak Grove plantation is a young man named Robert. Now Arthur lists him as being 28 years old and valued at $1,100. It's a handsome sum almost twice the average. Could this be our Robert? Well, let's keep going. Now, writing his report on July 3 to DuPont, Commander Prentice described the skirmish. DuPont had also a need for 60 volunteer contrabands to support operations aboard the USS Vermont at Port Royal. Apparently, more than that were ready, willing, and able to volunteer, as Prentice states in his letter. I forward the 60 you required for the Vermont by the hope, and would send them all if the Western world could possibly be spared. Now, it's believed Robert was one of those 60 who boarded the USS Hope on North Island, ironically, probably around Independence Day, and sailed for Port Royal in his new career as a Navy seaman. Now, we don't know a lot of specifics about what Robert did over the next year and a half, but we have some clues. About one-fourth of all Navy enlistments were African-American, close to 30,000. You see... The adoption of the Federal Enlistment Act in 1792 prohibited black men from enlisting in the Army. Now, this notwithstanding the great service such men performed during both the French and Indian War and the American Revolutionary War. That prohibition stayed in place until the Civil War had already been going on for more than a year. And then, even after allowing it, such men were placed in separate segregated units and were paid less, at least for a while, than their white counterparts. The Navy, on the other hand, had a long tradition of allowing men of color to serve aboard ship. Their numbers were limited by regulations beginning around 1840 to no more than 5% of the enlisted force, but nevertheless, they were allowed to enlist. And because of the cramped quarters and impracticability of segregating men aboard a ship, the Navy was integrated, at least technically so. So free black men from numerous states as well as from the Caribbean had served in the Navy throughout American history. Indeed, at the beginning of the Civil War, there were several hundred black men in the U.S. Navy. By the summer of 1862, the enlistment had increased so much that they constituted nearly 15% of the Navy's personnel. Of course, racism was rampant, and black men often were assigned the lowest ranks and the most menial tasks, making the already hard life of a sailor even harder. Indeed, making matters more complicated, contrabands who joined after the start of the Civil War had to carry the burden and stigma of the label former slave, making them, in the eyes of many aboard the ship, the lowest rung on the social pecking order. Even so, in some cases, viewed as such by other free men of African descent. And this led many contrabands to be assigned the laborious tasks of loading ships and supplies and other manual labor that supported naval operations, rather than being on the front lines of naval combat. And Port Royal was ideal for that as an operational hub for the South Atlantic Blockading Squadron. This is also perhaps why there were so few men of color in the Navy who received medals of honor compared to their numbers. They often weren't given the chance to fight. But when they did so, they performed honorably and admirably. The military also offered a certain degree of protection from discrimination as military regulations on behavior and discipline could serve as a neutral arbiter between white racist crew members and their African-American targets. Moreover, life aboard a ship could soften the views of some who either held racist views or had otherwise never been exposed to a person of African descent. There's a great article by historian Joseph Reedy. He's a professor emeritus at Howard University. He writes about the experiences of African-American sailors during the Civil War. It's called Black Men in Navy Blue During the Civil War. And it paints a complex picture of that experience, one not necessarily consistent with the Hollywood version of romantic heroism, but in my view, an even more compelling story, one that reveals lives rich with desire to serve, the challenges of that service, and their failures and successes. I'll add a link to his article in the show notes and over at the Frog blog at the Frog of History website. You should read it. 
Now, after arriving at Port Royal in July 1862, Robert would have likely found himself as one of those shore laborers, at least for a time. And this is where it gets a little murky because there appear to be these two Robert Blakes, both contrabands and both on different ships at the same time. One was assigned to the Gem of the Sea, while the other was assigned, even early on, to the USS Marblehead. And while it's not clear what he did after first arriving, we do know that by the end of September 1862, Robert was already aboard the USS Marblehead, which was a steam-powered gunboat. And Robert, along with a couple of other escaped slaves, is listed on the September 30th, 1862 muster roll among the crew as having been transferred to the Marblehead from the USS Vermont at Port Royal. Now, his fellow contrabands were Billy Blake and Nat Blake, certainly likely slaves from Blake's plantation. Indeed, there are a couple of Billys and Nats on Old Arthur's claim forms. Robert's entry on the Marblehead's muster rolls identifies him as a contraband, and like all the other seamen, he was given a crew member's number. His number was 97. Now, the old Navy muster rolls also show a Robert Blake on the Marblehead in the spring of 1863, about six months later. But there's also a Robert Blake that shows up on the USS Norwich. So there seems to be a lot of overlap. And the ages, if they are listed, don't match up. At some times, Robert is listed as being 22, while on the Norwich, he's 28. But for our purposes, we do know that a Robert Blake was listed on the Marblehead in the fall of 1863. And that's where our hero becomes, well, a hero. Now, the commander of the Marblehead was Commander Richard W. Meade III. He came from a long line of Navy officers. He would eventually retire as a rear admiral. You may have heard of his uncle. Uncle George was Major General George Meade, commander of the Union forces at the Battle of Gettysburg. Now, Commander Meade also wrote an account of the events aboard the Marblehead that led to the Navy awarding four medals of honor, including Roberts. Now, the Marblehead was one of those 90 days boats, a small steamship. It was made out of wood by George W. Jackman at Newburyport in Massachusetts. And like many other steamers at the time, she also had sails and was schooner rigged with two masts. She cost about $96,500 to build. And while normally carrying a crew of about 100, in late 1863, the crew consisted of about 70 men. And in the fall of 1863, the Marblehead was attached to the Southern American blockading fleet under Rear Admiral John Dahlgren. And she was on duty in the Stono River, along with the steam sloop Pawnee and the mortar schooner Williams. The Marblehead was stationed a little above Laguerreville, near the confluence of the Stono and Kiowa Rivers, about 10 miles south of Charleston. It was anchored in midstream. And just before daylight, on Christmas Day, 1863, the Marblehead came under a surprise attack by Confederate artillery and infantry. The Confederates had been planning the attack for some time. The idea was to disable the Marblehead and take the 150 Union troops stationed on Johns Island in Laguerreville. They had been sinking piles in the river as part of the blockade. The Confederates had established 8-inch cannons behind some earthworks in the woods near Laguerreville, and they fired at the Marblehead from about 1,000 yards away, a little over half a mile. At that time, the Marblehead was not only shorthanded, but was partially disabled, as one of her boilers was under repair. And the Marblehead's largest gun, an 11-incher, had been pointed amidships as the sailors prepared to wash down the deck as part of their normal morning duties. Now, Meade was caught off guard by the attack and assumed the rebels were boarding the ship. He grabbed his sword and revolver and left his cabin with his nightshirt and slippers on. He called for his African-American servant to bring his clothes to him. And many have assumed that his servant was Robert, but this isn't clear. And Meade never mentions Robert as being his servant. In fact, there was a 15-year-old free African-American boy from Boston named Charles Taylor aboard, who was listed as a waiter and ranked as a landsman. It could be that Charles was the servant Meade refers to in his account. And this is bolstered by the fact that Meade never mentions Robert as a servant when discussing him. Instead, he specifically refers to him as a powder man now that was his general quarters job, so Robert probably did other work when not at his battle station, but Meade never refers to Robert as his valet or waiter or servant. Now Meade ordered the Marblehead closer to the shore and the attackers as a way to destroy the enemy's range by rapid movement closer to them. And because it was low tide, he could protect the hull of the ship closer to the enemy than in midstream. He would engage the enemy with the port that is the left broadside cannons. The ship's cannons fired 44 times in an hour during their artillery battle. 
Now, the rebels had the range on the Marblehead initially and hit shot after shot, according to Meade. They killed three sailors and wounded six in the first 15 minutes. The decks, Meade said, were soon slippery with blood. And as the Marblehead approached the shore, the tactic worked, and the enemy lost its range. And soon the Pawnee and the Williams moved up the river and joined the fight, hammering the Confederate positions. The battle lasted for at least an hour. And as steel and wood splintered across the deck, the Marblehead's crew continued firing. One sailor, a sponger, whose job it was to ram the sponge down the gun barrel after firing to clean it out, was cut in two by a round from the rebel's cannon. A second sponger, who was to take his place, hesitated after seeing the mutilated man lying on the deck at his feet. Bosun's mate, William Farley, leaned over his cannon, pointed his revolver at the frightened sponger, and shouted, Pick up that sponge, damn you! The sponger obeyed, and the gun kept firing. At one point during the battle, the ship turned so that the starboard side battery could come into action. This exposed one of the crew, the quartermaster, James Miller, to heavy fire. The captain called for him to take cover, but Miller stayed at his post under fire. There was also an Irish sailor serving aboard the Marblehead, Charles Moore. Now, he was 28, but he had only joined six months earlier. A shot struck the rail and decapitated the gun captain of the gun at which Moore was stationed. Moore was wounded by a piece of the pine from the ship that struck his head and stripped off a large portion of his scalp. He was taken below to the ship's surgeon who tried to dress the wound as best he could. Moore refused to stay below and returned to his post to fight some more. He kept losing so much blood, though, that he eventually passed out and had to be taken below again. And among all this mayhem and real danger, young Robert Blake stepped into the fray. Robert was a powder man of the 20-pounder rifle. The gun is also known as a parrot rifle, after its inventor, Captain Robert Parker Parrot. They call it a parrot rifle, but to the uninformed eye, it looks like a cannon. They call it a 20-pounder because that's the weight of the projectile. The word rifle just refers to the rifling in the barrel. That is, the grooves machined into the bore of the gun's barrel, causing spin and greater accuracy of the projectile. More properly, the parrot gun is rifled artillery. You've seen rifling, though, if you've ever watched a James Bond movie. During the opening credits, there's a gun barrel sequence in which some assassin aims his gun at the silhouetted James Bond, who senses he's about to be shot and turns and fires at the assassin before he can get off his own shot. That barrel through which we see Mr. Bond has little spirals twisting inside it, getting narrower as our point of view goes down the barrel to the unsuspecting 007. Those little grooves are the barrel's rifling. And now you know far more than you need to for our story but your life's better for it. And here's an interesting little coincidence. The very first Medal of Honor recipient was a 19-year-old kid from Fairfield County, Ohio, named Jacob Parrott. How cool is that? The first Medal of Honor recipient, Jacob Parrott. First African-American Medal of Honor recipient, manning the Parrott gun, Robert Blake. And since we're on the strange and coincidental, remember the once famous actor, Robert Blake? He played the detective Beretta in the 1970s with the catchy phrase and theme song, don't do the crime if you can't do the time. Blake's character had a pet named Fred. What was Fred? Fred was a cockatoo, a species of, you guessed it, parrot. How weird is that? A whole lot of parrots and Blakes going on in this story. Anyway, the parrot gun was on the forecastle. That's just another Navy term. It means the front of the ship. Usually the forecastle contained the crew's quarters in the bow. The gun literally sat on top of those quarters outside on the front of the ship. You can see it in old photos of the Marblehead. And while the cannons along the side of the ship were somewhat protected by the hull, just like in old ships when you think about the guns pointing out from inside the ship's hull, the parrot gun was unprotected. You were a sitting duck, sitting parrot, as the case may be, if you were part of its crew. Now Robert, according to Captain Meade, was the gun's powder man. Now a powder man did exactly what you think he did. His job was to carry gunpowder from the powder magazine to the guns. Now the powder magazine was designed to avoid explosions or fires by keeping the gunpowder safe until needed. Now powder boys or powder monkeys or powder men as they were called were usually young men in their teens. They were often short and fast. They were picked for the job because of their ability to squeeze and slither quickly between the tight spots on the ship where the powder was kept. It turns out that in one of the muster rolls, Robert is described as only being five feet five inches tall. So even though he was a little older, he was still likely a very good candidate to act as a powder man. So it's not surprising that he was assigned to that role. Now Meade described Robert's actions this way. 
the captain's attention was soon attracted to him by the excellent manner in which he served his gun, his coolness, intrepidity, and high spirits, and the merry laugh with which he cheered his comrades under the severe and galling fire of the enemy. He seemed wholly insensible to fear, and cut jokes with his comrades as he passed along to the magazine with his passing box under his arm. Besides which, he showed a marked degree of intelligence and forethought during the hottest part of the fight in bringing exactly the right cartridges for the guns. Now by 8 a.m. the battle was over. Notably, the Confederates didn't even think they were hitting the ship. Their reports of the battle thought that the fire from the guns was ineffective due to poor aim. General G.T. Beauregard noted in a telegram to General Cooper the next day, Expedition to destroy two gunboats in the Stono yesterday failed through bad firing of our batteries. We had one man killed and five wounded, eight horses disabled. I will try another plan. Indeed, Confederate Colonel P.R. Page, who commanded the expedition, filed a detailed report noting that the artillery fired badly. This, there is reason to believe, was, in a measure at least, owing to the very inferior quality of the ammunition and want of practice in firing. There was a lot of quibbling among the Confederate officers after the battle as to who was to blame for their retreat and the loss of two eight-inch howitzers during the battle. General Beauregard put it best, though, when he said, Without more tenacity of purpose and decision on the part of those entrusted with such expeditions, failure or discomfiture will be the invariable issue. Now that same Christmas day on December 25th, Commander Meade sent his report of the battle. It went up the chain of command to Rear Admiral Dahlgren. The Admiral was informed of the attack that three men had been killed and four wounded. In his report, Meade states that both officers and men of this vessel behaved admirably. And though the vessel was struck over 20 times and was much cut up aloft, on deck, and in personnel, stood their guns until the enemy retired discomfited from theirs. After describing the actions of the more senior sailors, he then turns to the actions of the lowest ranking sailor. Robert Blake, a contraband, excited my admiration by the cool and brave manner in which he served the rifle gun. Admiral Dahlgren replied back directly to Meade only two days later, noting he had received the report and congratulating him and approving several promotions, including one for Robert to seaman. Only four months later, on April 16, 1864, Secretary of the Navy Gideon Wells issued General Order No. 32. In it, he awarded several medals of honor. Among them were the four crewmen of the Marblehead for the Christmas Day battle. They were William Farley, the boatswain's mate who yelled at the sponger to pick up the sponge, James Miller, the quartermaster who stayed at his post, the inexperienced Charles Moore, who lost his scalp and fought on, and Robert Blake, escaped slave. After describing the events of the battle, the order goes on to say that Robert Blake, serving as powder boy, displayed extraordinary courage, alacrity, and intelligence in the discharge of his duties under trying circumstances, and merited the admiration of all. Now, in typical Stoic fashion, the official military citation for the medal reads as follows. On board the U.S. steam gunboat Marblehead off Laguerreville, Stono River, 25 December 1863, in an engagement with the enemy on Johns Island. Serving the rifle gun, Blake, an escaped slave, carried out his duties bravely throughout the engagement, which resulted in the enemy's abandonment of positions, leaving a caisson and one gun behind. Now, over 30 years later, Commander Meade, then an admiral, wrote an account of the battle. In it, Meade describes the battle in detail and the actions of the crew, focusing on the four Medal of Honor recipients. And after describing Robert's actions, he noted that Robert was given the rate of seaman by Admiral Dahlgren for his heroism and good conduct, and received the Medal of Honor in $100. He goes on to say, Whatever became of him does not appear, as there is no record of him in the books at the Navy Department. But if he is still alive, he is doubtless somewhere in the sunny south, as cheery as ever. And Meade summed up Robert's actions this way. No man ever deserved a Medal of Honor more truly than this gallant young Negro. From the captain down, every man on the Marblehead honored the ex-slave, Robert Blake. So what happened to Robert? 
Well, it appears that he continued in the Navy for the next couple of years. And instead of fleeing the war, like his former master, Arthur Blake, he chose to re-enlist. He served on the Vermont and then maybe the Norwich through 1864 and into 1865. But even that isn't clear because, as I said before, it looks like there may have been two Robert Blakes. Indeed, some have reported that after the war ended, he returned to Beaufort, South Carolina, apparently as a carpenter. Now, there's a pension application from 1890 that indicates he received $8 a month for his service to his country. But this Robert Blake, who also took the surname Singleton, might not be the same Robert Blake. In his pension application, he describes his service on the Gem of the Sea, the Norwich, and then the New Hampshire. This is likely the Robert Blake who was one of the five contrabands picked up in the boat by the Gem of the Sea. But he never mentions the Marblehead, on which Robert served a long time, according to the muster rolls. Nor does he mention the Medal of Honor. He also says he's 65 years old, which would have made him in his late 30s during the war. So it's just not clear it's the same person. This isn't to say, though, that this Robert, who may not be the Medal of Honor recipient, doesn't deserve our attention and admiration. Indeed, his life demonstrates the plight of many Civil War veterans, especially African-American veterans. This Robert was a carpenter. We know he married in 1865, soon after the war, and lost his first wife in 1887. We know he attended an African Methodist Episcopal Church. And we know that in the late 1880s, a year after his first wife died, he fell from a platform at the Brotherhood's Phosphate Mine, where he worked as a carpenter. Robert fell 25 feet and was nearly disabled from the fall. Within a few years, he couldn't work and applied for a veteran's invalid pension in 1890, where he describes his naval service and the few tidbits we know of his life after the war. We learn also that he remarried in 1892, but by 1893, he had succumbed to his infirmities and died on May 1st, 1893. His second wife, Maria, applied to receive his pension. No one can find his grave, or any other grave for that matter, of Robert Blake, or Robert Blake Medal of Honor recipient. Their lives have been lost in the fog of history. Now, who knows, maybe someone listening to this podcast will take up the search for the missing Medal of Honor recipient, Robert Blake, the first African American to receive that award. So that perhaps one day, if his final resting place is discovered, a proper Medal of Honor headstone or medallion might be placed there so that any who may pass by will know who lies beneath. The least we can do for such a great sacrifice from a young man who chose to stay and fight. To fight for his freedom, the freedom of his people, and for the preservation of a nation that owes him an enduring debt of gratitude. I'm your host, Don Griffith. Thanks for listening. That's it for this episode of The Frog of History. If you'd like to learn more about The Frog, and maybe even a bit more about history, hop on over to our website at www.frogofhistory.com. Send questions or ideas for future podcasts to contact at frogofhistory.com. The Frog of History podcast is a production of Big Frog and Little Pond Enterprises. The producer, host, and all-around bullfrog was Don Griffith. No amphibians were harmed in the production of this episode.